Everything we've been talking about so far is broadly called Mendelian inheritance. This basically means that it's following the laws of Mendel, so that the um, their segregation of the alleles, there's two um, two copies, two um, alleles for the gene, and they um, they assort independently. Um, what we'll find out in the next chapter is that actually a relatively small number of traits and conditions actually fall under this Mendelian inheritance. But it clearly um, helped us understand inheritance a lot. It was the first place that we really started in our scientific understanding of inheritance. So even though, like I said, we'll find out that this doesn't actually account for that many of the traits that um, we have and that other organisms have, it's still really important to understand. What we've actually been talking about so far is um, even more specifically called simple Mendelian inheritance, and that's where you see complete dominance. So when we were talking about purple flower color and white flower color, for example, purple was completely dominant to white. What that means is that you had only two phenotypes. It was either purple or white. So even if it was a heterozygote, it was the same exact color of purple. There was no dark purple, light purple, and white. You see what I'm saying? So complete dominance means you only see the totally dominant trait and the totally recessive trait. And the X-linked inheritance that we were just talking about is really just a variation on that. It's just altered because men only have one copy of the X. So we're going to talk now about some variations on Mendelian inheritance. They're still going to follow um, Mendelian inheritance, but it's not going to be as straightforward as simple Mendelian inheritance. So to understand these variations, we first need to understand what makes something dominant. So, you know, it's not like the dominant allele has a hammer and it squishes the recessive allele, and that's kind of silly, but we most people tend to, like, hear that word dominant, and they think, oh, the, the dominant allele is somehow a bully. Really, the only thing that makes an allele dominant is how the protein that it codes for um, works. So, again, remember that alleles are really genes. Genes get read to make proteins, so whether an allele is completely dominant or not really has to do with the function of the protein. So usually the um, dominant and recessive is really about wild type versus mutant. So the wild type allele is the allele that's most common in the population, and usually that means it's making the protein in the right amount um, and, and making it so that it functions normally. The mutant alleles tend to be rare, and there's some sort of change in the DNA sequence that usually, again, not always, but usually makes it so that it doesn't make the normal protein anymore. So that means that when you have that mutant allele, you're making less of the protein. So in simple dominance, making less of the protein isn't going to matter because a single copy of the dominant allele is still going to be enough normal protein to make the same color. So we'll walk through the example here with the flower color. So remember that the homozygous dominant and the heterozygote, um, one has two copies of the big P allele and one has a, a one copy of the big P allele. So this allele is non-functional. It's a mutant version of it. So that means that this and this both work, and that's going to give you the maximum amount of protein that you can get. And this protein is making purple pigment. So it starts with some sort of precursor. Protein P is then going to make the purple color. And so 100% of the protein P gets made, and you get purple color. In the heterozygote, this copy of the gene doesn't work right. So that means you only get 50% of protein P. So you're making less of protein P. But because of the way that the purple pigment works and the way protein P works, these two are identical. They make the exact same color. The only like analogy that I can really give you on this is to if you've ever painted a room. If you've painted, you'll be familiar with the idea that there's certain types of paint and certain colors of paint that you can only put one coat on. And no matter how many coats you do, it's always going to be basically the same color. Then there's other colors of paint where really every time you put on a coat, you're getting a darker color. So at first, 
the color is a little lighter. If you put on a second coat, the color is darker. If you put on a third coat, the color is even darker. And that's just based on the chemistry of the paint and different complex things. The same thing is true in the cell. Something about the purple pigment makes it that where one coat, right, so 50%, one coat is the exact same color as two coats or 100% of the protein. Still going to be the same uh, exact color. Now, the homozygous recessive now has two copies of the gene that doesn't work. So now it makes 0% of the, of the purple pigment. So I don't have any of this, so I won't make any purple pigment. So I'll have a colorless precursor molecule only. And in nature, um, the white color is usually the absence of color. So it's not that there's white paint in this plant. It's that there's no color, so you see white. So this is a case, again, of complete dominance. A hundred percent of the protein is going to look exactly the same color as 50 percent of the protein. So in some cases there's not complete dominance. This is called incomplete dominance. And so this is a different pigment, a different flower, and for some reason in this pigment and this flower 50 percent of the protein is going to look like 50 percent of the color. So the colors here are red and white. If I have 50% of red, right, it's less red. What does less red look like? Pink. So incomplete dominance is characterized by having three phenotypes. In this case, red, pink, and white. So this is an intermediate, pink is an intermediate between white and red. So a plant that has two red alleles will be um, red. A plant that is heterozygous, so a red and a white, will be pink. And only a plant that has the two white alleles will be white. And so this is, um, uh, you'll also notice that I used um, a superscript here. So C R C R C R C W C W C W. And that's um, one of the ways that we indicate that there's incomplete dominance. So if you ever see somebody using that, what they're telling you is that this is a case of incomplete dominance. You can also do Punnett squares, just like we've done before. So maybe I want to cross a pink plant with a pink plant. So I've got one, pla um, one, one parent there, the other parent on the side. And now I combine, just like we've done before. And if I cross a pink plant with a pink plant, I'm going to get one red to two pink to one white. So again, you can do crosses just like you do with, um, just like you do with uh, those, the simple dominance that we've been doing before. And again, this is just because the chemistry of this pigment is, is that one coat looks lighter colored, so it's pink, not red, compared to two coats. And this is incomplete dominance. Another variation of Mendelian inheritance is co-dominance and multiple alleles. So a blood typing is a perfect example of both multiple alleles and co-dominance. So co-dominance is when you have um, alleles expressed equally. So this is a case where one allele is not non-functional. It's just a totally different product. Um, so that's co-dominance. And then in the case, there's um, a lot of traits where there's multiple alleles present in the population. So every individual still gets two alleles. Okay, so that's not where there's multiples, but there's more than two to choose from. because there's more than two present in the population. So in the previous examples we've looked at, like there was the purple allele and the white allele, the tall allele or the dwarf allele, the red allele or the white allele.
that's all cases where there's only two alleles present in the population. With blood typing, there's actually three alleles present in the population. There's the A allele, the B allele, and the O allele. So those are the three alleles present in the population. Each individual still only gets two, but that determines their blood type. So for example, if somebody is two O alleles, then their blood type O. If they have two A's, or an A and an O, then their blood type A. If they have two B's, or a B and an O, then they are O, I'm oh, sorry, not O, B, type B. And then if they have an A and a B, then their blood type AB, and I'm getting a little cut off there, but um, that'll be blood type AB. So notice that we have multiple things going on here. We have um, simple dominance. So here, this A is dominant to I, so you only see blood type I, A, sorry, and B is um, completely dominant to the O allele, so you see blood type B. It's A and B that are co-dominant. So blood type AB is co-dominant. So they're going to make the A product and the B product equally. So to understand this, let's talk about what um, makes blood typing or w what is going on in, in your body for the, what, what this blood typing means. So this is really about your red blood cells. So this is your red blood cell. And you, you, the, the O antigen is made from the O gene. Um, and it's just basically this sort of um, root or base molecule. And notice that every single blood type is going to have that same base, right? So every single blood type, regardless of what they are, will have that same base. So O only has the base because they have these recessive alleles. They don't have the A and B, and so they won't add on to it. If you have an A allele, so you're either two A's or just have one A, then you're going to add on this extra part. So see this little orange dot here? You're adding on that extra part to the base. If you have a B allele, so now I'm looking at type B, instead you're going to add on this green triangle. So you put a green triangle onto your base. If you're type AB, then you've got both the A allele and the B allele. And so this is where it's co-dominance. They're going to make both the A antigen, so the little orange dot, or they're going to, and sorry, rather, and they're going to make the green triangle. So they make the orange dot and the green triangle equally. And that's what makes this co-dominance. So this is significant for health. As you may know, um, type O is the universal donor. Type AB is the universal receiver. And this has to do with our immune systems. So our immune systems use these antigens on our red blood cells to know that that is us, that it's self, basically. So if you're type A, for example, your body recognizes this part, so the, the little base structure, and this part as you. So I can give you O blood and I can give you A blood. Either one of those is not, your body will see that and, and it'll recognize it as self even if it's not from you. If you're type B, then your body can only, then your body recognizes this part and the green triangle. So I can give you O blood because your body will recognize this and I can give you B blood because your body recognizes the green triangle, no problems. If you're type AB, then your body recognizes the base, it recognizes the orange, and it recognizes the green all as self. So I can give you O blood, I can give you A blood, or I can give you B blood. All of those you're going to recognize as yourself. Somebody who is O blood can only receive O blood because they have this base part and that's the only part that they have. That's the only part they recognize as self. So if you give them an, an orange dot, that's going to seem foreign to this person. 
to their immune system. If you give them a green triangle, that's going to seem foreign to them. If you give them AB, that's going to be foreign to them. So O, um, people who are type O can only receive O blood. Now sometimes people are like, oh, no, does that mean there's a problem with O blood? Well, it turns out that O blood is actually the most common type blood type in the U.S., so there's not necessarily a problem um, for, for people who are type O because um, there's a lot of people who um, are also type O. But that's um, how blood typing works, and again, it's an excellent example of multiple alleles and codominance. So assume that you are blood group O and your mother is blood group A. Your father could be any blood group except which one. So we can um, kind of logic this out. So if you're blood group O, you must be, so let's, I like to do little pedigrees. So these are the parents and this is the child. I'm not blood group O, but imagining that I am, I would have to be two little eyes. And it says that my mother is blood group A, so she must have at least one A. And I know that she must have an O allele. How do I know? Because I must have inherited one of these O alleles, right? I must have also inherited this other O allele from my father. So I can fill in the other side of that with either an A, a B, or this. So my dad, in this scenario, could be blood type A, blood type B, or blood type O. What he cannot be is blood type AB. So he could not be that and have me be um, type O. And so this is how actually they used to do paternity tests. It wasn't super conclusive necessarily because you could, um, so this would only rule out, for example, somebody who had AB as the father. Um, but it was one way to do paternity testing. It was also one way in, back in the back in the old days, <laughs> you know, like the 80s, <laughs> um, this was one way that they could do crime scene stuff if they had a lot of um, blood at a crime scene. Um, they could look for blood typing and they could rule out suspects based on blood typing. So again, you know, kind of old school way of doing it. We don't do it that way anymore. Okay, another interesting variation of Mendelian inheritance is sex-influenced inheritance. So I'm just going to circle this word big time here, sex-influenced. It is not on sex chromosomes. Remember, if it's on a sex chromosome, it's called sex-linked. Sex-influenced inheritance is when it has to do with the presence or absence of hormones. And hormones are controlled by the sex, but it's not directly related to the sex chromosomes. So, um, you know, if you think about breast cancer, for example, um, breast cancer, even when it's, there's a genetic component to, to it, is sex-influenced. Even a man who has the, the breast cancer genes is not going to get breast cancer usually because there's a huge influence of estrogen. The other example here is male pattern baldness. So male, male pattern baldness is an example of a sex influence trait. It has everything to do with testosterone. So because of testosterone, a higher testosterone in men versus women, there will be a very different outcome even though they have the same genotype. So women who are homozygous or heterozygous will not be bald. Only women who get two bald alleles will be bald. And really, you probably know that even um, women who do get some hair thinning later in life will never look like this. This is almost very, very, very rarely seen in women. So this sort of typical male pattern baldness, um, even in women who have the genes, will not get that. They'll just mainly get thinning of their hair later in life. However, men, will only not be bald if they have the two normal alleles. If they get, if they're heterozygous or they're homozygous for baldness, then they will get baldness. And um, so you can also say, this is another way to think of it if this helps you, in women, baldness is recessive. In men, baldness is dominant. 
because, again, of the presence of testosterone. So in men, there's a much greater amount of testosterone, and that's why um, they'll get male pattern baldness. So again, if you're looking at like a family tree, you're going to see men get it a lot more than women. But again, it's not because it's on the sex chromosomes, but because it has to do with testosterone. So here's a little question for you. So imagine I have a genetic female. So she's born as XX, and she has, uh, for her um, baldness genes, she has a normal allele and a B allele. Would she be bald or not? So again, remember that in women, this trait is, um, is recessive, so she is not going to be bald. Okay, but imagine that this woman gets a sex change. So this, this person is going to get a sex change, and what you may or may not know is that a sex change is going to involve dosing of hormones. So large amounts of testosterone are going to be given to this person to facilitate the sex change. So in that case, what would happen? Would she be bald or he, she, he or she be bald um, or not? And so hopefully you realize that the presence of testosterone would cause this individual to become bald, even though they were a genetic female. So that question that I was just talking about, the sex change, also illustrates the critical role of the environment in genetics. So it's really important to realize that our genes are a starting point for our traits, but in reality, almost all of our traits have a strong environmental component. So there's lots and lots of really simple examples of this. For example, these are genetically identical plants um, in this experiment, but you can see that at a specific temperature, so an optimal temperature, the plant will grow taller. If the temperature is too hot or too cold, the plant will be shorter, even though they're genetically identical. And again, that's just showing this, this the, the height, plant height, is critically influenced by environment. PKU is a disease um, that is inherited. Um, it has to do with the inability to digest phenylalanine. And because they can't digest it, it will build up in their systems. Um, and the end result is usually severe um, mental handicap. Um, and so in this picture, this is a picture of a family, and this is the eldest child. So this child, they didn't realize she had PKU, so they didn't um, change her diet, and so she ended up with severe, severe symptoms. So you can see she can't walk. She clearly has um, severe um, improper mental development. The second sibling, if you can see here, um, he's not in a wheelchair, um, but he's also not fully um, normally developed. Um, he was the second child. He got diagnosed sooner because his eldest sister got diagnosed, and then they tested him um, and realized that he had it, and so they changed his diet, but it was basically too late in, um, to prevent all problems. The third child here you can see is totally normal, so appears normal, but genetically has the disease. So what happened is by the time this little girl was born, they knew they were carriers for PKU. So this girl was tested immediately and her diet was changed immediately. And so as long as she um, maintains that diet into adulthood, so its most critical period is, is um, into early, early adulthood, um, then she won't ever have any symptoms of PKU. Uh, so this is a, a place where, yeah, she genetically has the disease, but if we can manipulate her environment, then she'll never have any symptoms of the disease. And actually, that's one of the reasons why um, when, um, when children are born in most states, they're going to be automatically screened for a whole host of diseases, but it starts with PKU. So if you screen um, babies for PKU and you can prevent them from having the, the diet issues or put them onto the right diet right away, you can prevent all of the problems. So it's now part of the, the newborn screen. In Colorado, it's, it's required by law. Um, you know, there's lots of other examples of this. Human height has a huge environmental component. 
So we think of human height as being genetic, and certainly there is a genetic component. Some people are taller than others, but there's also a huge environmental component. And if you think about it, um, this is most obvious if you've ever been in an old house. Um, a house built in the, in the 1800s has much shorter door frames because people on average were much shorter back then. If you looked at the average height of a Civil War soldier, they were about 5'8". 5'8 is not very tall for an American man. I think the average now for American men is like 5'10". Um, and that's due to changes in health and nutrition. And um, if you look across the globe, you'll see that there's huge gains in height in some countries. So Northern Europeans are some of the tallest people in the world, and that's attributed primarily to um, really good health care um, and really good nutrition um, and just a really good quality of life. So actually, human height is, is a readout for how healthy people are, um, how healthy their environment is. Um, these gains in, in human height and has nothing to do with genetics. It's this increased height. It's a readout for quality of life. So um, some environmental influences are really particular. Um, and when they do, it's, or when they're like that, there's like a norm of reaction. And so this is a range that will occur. Um, with a particular genotype. And so the classic example of this is the colors of these flowers. These are genetically identical. So totally like very different colors, um, but they're genetically identical. The difference is the norm of reaction based on acid in the soil. So at one range of pH, you'll get this color towards the other range you'll get this color and then you can get anywhere in between based on the acidity. So that's the norm of reaction is the range of phenotypes you can get based on a particular environmental um, influence.